Who doesn't love a good underdog story? Hey everybody, this is Pastor Justin Walker with The Whole Truth. We're going through the entire Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We're not skipping anything. Every single day you get a new video. Well, Monday through Friday you get a new video and we're going step by step through the Bible explaining what's actually happening in God's Word. We've been talking about this guy named Joseph who at 17 years old, he was the favorite of his father. He had the coat of many colors. Remember that? Joseph in the coat of many colors. Well, Joseph at 17 years old was sold into slavery by his brothers who hated him because he was the favorite of his father. They threw him down in a pit. They sold him to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites sold him to the Egyptians. And then uh, Joseph was a slave in Potiphar's house in Egypt. That's the captain of the guard, Potiphar. He was there for 11 years. Potiphar's wife lied about Joseph. Joseph was then put into the dungeon. He ascended in the ranks and power, if you will, but he was still in prison for two more years. Do the math, 11 years plus two more years. This guy has been imprisoned or enslaved for the past 13 years of his life. 17 years of his life, he got to live with his dad. The last 13 years, the man has been in slavery, but Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had a dream. And in that dream, there were these seven fat calves and seven skinny, ugly, uh, acid calves, but cows, seven skinny, ugly cows, ate the fat cows. Then seven heads of ugly grain, ate seven uh, good-looking fat uh, heads of grain. Joseph was called to interpret the dream, and he interpreted it. He said, there's going to be seven years of famine, and there's going to be seven years of feast. First comes the feast, fat cows, fat heads of grain. Then comes the famine, skinny cows and skinny heads of grain. And the famine is going to be severe. And that's what he had just told uh the Pharaoh before this story. And he said, listen, Pharaoh, you need to set somebody up. You need to put somebody in charge of gathering up one fifth of all the grain of all the land for the next seven years. There's going to be plenty in the land for the next seven years. Gather up one fifth of that. You're going to need it. Check out what happens right here. Look at this underdog story. Genesis 41 verse 37. Genesis 41 verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh. And in the eyes of all his uh, of all his servants, and Pharaoh said to his servants, "Can we find such a one as this man, in whom is the spirit of God?" Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, "Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word." In regard to the throne, well, uh, in regard to the, only <clears throat> in regard to the throne, will I be great? than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all of the land of Egypt. Whoa. It's like in a moment. I mean, when we read the story, when we read that part, Genesis chapter 41 and verse 37, you get to this point where you're like, wow. I mean, this is like, forgive me for using the term, but this is like winning the lottery, right? Don't forget this guy's been in prison and enslaved for 13 years. He has been sold solely for the reason that his brothers hated him. He was put in prison because a a woman lied about him and made a false accusation against him when he had done nothing wrong. He had helped two other men who were upset that day in prison, and he had interpreted their dreams, and they even forgot about him, and he still remained down in the prison. This man has not had an easy life, but then look. He goes and he interprets the dream. And what do you see? What do, what do we see? Is that Pharaoh says, is there anybody? Can we find any such one, any such a man in whom is the spirit of God? The spirit of God was living in Joseph and it was visible to those who were around him. Listen, I want you to understand this. The blessings that we have come from God. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with working hard. I don't think there's anything wrong with having aspirations and saying, I want to do better or I want to do good and I want to have a, I want to do, you know, good for my kids and for my family. We're supposed to take care of our kids and of our family and of our wife and our, our, you know, the rest of your family, even your mom and dad when they get older. We're supposed to help our family and take care of each other. We're supposed to do that. Those are good things. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be able to take care of your family. But understand this. Every blessing that you have comes from God. And therefore, you will never reach a point where you don't need God or his blessings anymore. There's never going to come a point when you when you say, "Oh, well, I've, you know, God did that part, but this is the part that I've done and I need to keep doing this." 
No, we will always need God, no matter how blessed you are or how blessed you don't feel, you still need God. It's not always about how hard you can work. Sometimes, and all the time, it's about who you trust. Do you put your trust in him? I love this part of the story when Joseph is out of prison and now in just a moment he is set over the house of Pharaoh. And check this out. Look at what what happens in verse 42. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. Can you imagine? Can you imagine him taking his ring off and putting it onto the hand of of Joseph? I mean, saying, you're you're in charge. You make the calls. Right now, you make the calls. The signet ring is is on his hand. He put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And so he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And Without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. So Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paania, and he uh, and he gave him a wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. So Joseph went on uh, went out over all the land of Egypt, and Joseph was thirty years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and throughout all the land, and and, and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly, and so he gathered up all the food of those seven years which were in the land of Egypt. And he laid up the food in the cities, and he laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. And to Joseph there was born two sons before the years of famine came, who Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, a priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, and for God had made me forget all my toil and uh, and all my father's house. And in the name of the second, he called Ephraim, for God had caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began and to and to, uh, to began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all the land, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished and the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, you do. The famine was over all the face of the earth and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians and the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all the lands. Now I know that was a lot to read and that took a couple of minutes, but please get the whole picture. Joseph is set in power over all the land of Egypt, and then he begins to do what he told Pharaoh he was going to do. He begins to gather up the grain, so much so that it becomes immeasurable. He just quits counting. You can't even measure it. There is so much grain in the storehouses. And remember, if there's that much grain in the storehouses, these seven years of plenty, these seven years of feast were good years. The people who were having one-fifth removed from their grain and to have it stored up, I'm sure in the moment they were fussing and complaining about having that one-fifth taken from them. But remember, they still had four-fifths. They still had 80%. And if there was so much that that one-fifth was immeasurable, imagine how much they had at four-fifths. They had plenty. But Joseph had the wisdom of God upon him, and he was saving up, and he was saving for that day that was to come. And God was doing something. I want to talk about the physical for just a moment. God was doing something in in the physical world, in the real world. God was doing something. He was prepping so that the family, remember this came from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob who became Israel and later had Joseph as his son and all the other brothers hated Joseph. And so they sold Joseph into slavery. Now Joseph, look, Joseph is in power. Joseph has all of the grain, but the famine is severe in all the land. So that that means that Jacob over here and Jacob's sons, all those other sons who sold Joseph all those years earlier, they're starving. They're being hit by the famine, and Joseph is going to have an opportunity to save them. And we'll talk about that in another video, but for now, that's just that God is aligning things in this world, but he's also doing something else. He is picturing Christ 
for us. Would you do this? I know we're running a little long today, but just turn, just turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. If you need to pause it, just hit pause in the video, go to Philippians. It's in the New Testament chapter 2 and verse 5, or you can even look it up there on your phone or whatever you might be watching. Probably have a Bible app. You could look it up there, but check this out. I want you to see the connection between Joseph and Jesus. Joseph, who was sold into slavery, Joseph, who was put into prison, Joseph, who was lied about, he now has uh, ascended to power and literally is in power in all of Egypt and everybody is subject to him. Check this out. This is Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being born in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Joseph pictures Jesus in that Joseph was a slave. He was sold into into slavery. He was put into the dungeon. He was of no reputation. Listen, Joseph was the underdog for a while. But then when God began to bless him, Joseph ascended in power in Egypt, and now he is second in command only to Pharaoh. He is the one, he rules over all of Egypt, That's what he went from prison. He went from a servant to being ruler over all of Egypt. May I tell you that Jesus, who is God, came down to this earth in the form of a bond servant. He came willingly, and he was a servant willingly. Remember, Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus came so that he might give us life. He who is God came down to this earth in the form of a man. Now, Jesus, that's what Paul was saying. I can't go into all of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 right now, but that's what Paul was saying when he was writing, when he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, Jesus had no problem saying that he is equal with God, and yet he who is equal with God was in the form of a man. And at one point, even Jesus said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. Listen, Jesus came down to this earth in the form of a man and he died for our sins, became obedient even to the point of the cross, even obedient to death, the death on the cross. And therefore, God has given him a name that is above every name. Just like Joseph was given a name that was above every name by Pharaoh, God has given Jesus a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Jesus is Lord. Every tongue will confess that. You see, Jesus became a servant. And and as a servant, he died. He didn't just even die as a servant. I should be even more clear and say that he died as a sinner, though he was not a sinner. Just like Joseph was put into prison, though he had done no wrong and he was not a he not really should not have been a true prisoner because he had done anything, but he was a prisoner because of what the accusations that were made against him. Jesus took our sin upon himself, and he became he who knew no sin became sin for us. And why did he why did he do that? So that we could become the righteousness of God in him. You do you, do you see the picture? Do you see how one parallels the other? Jesus became a servant, and God has exalted him above every name. And you should hear this. Whether you want to admit it or not, one day every knee will bow to Jesus. Every tongue will confess. You know, there's a an, an old saying that says it this way. Listen, whether, whether, whether you believe it or not, you will face Jesus. The question is, will you face him today in salvation? Or will you wait until you cross over? by death, and you're on the other side facing him, bowing a knee to him, recognizing who he is as God, will you face him in condemnation? Will you face him today? Will you accept him today? Will you bow the knee today? Today is salvation. He is God. But if you wait until you're there, you'll bow the knee to him, 
but it'll be in condemnation. That choice is yours. Jesus is calling unto you to be saved, but that day to be saved is now. It is today. Would you do that? All right, everybody, I hope that you've enjoyed today's video, and I will see you tomorrow with Genesis chapter 42. See you then.